Let us continue. So in the past lecture, we um, studied the equations of motion of matter. And remember, in cosmologists' lingo, that's including radiation. Now, the way that matter is influencing space-time is through the energy and the momentum that matter carries. Let us therefore now study the energy and momentum of matter in curved space-time. Now, in flat space-time, um, in flat space-time, in Minkowski space, the invariance of the action under translations in time and under translations in space implies the conservation of energy and momentum, respectively. Remember, this was this is a consequence of Noether's theorem. Any symmetry of the action translates into a conservation law. And in Minkowski space, the symmetry of the action under translations in time leads to energy conservation. The symmetry of the action under translations in space leads to momentum conservation. What about curved space? Well, now, <clears throat> When there are physical fields in space-time, then as they flow, they carry energy and momentum with them. So physical fields physical fields carry energy and momentum, and as we just said, Overall, while this energy and momentum is flowing around with the fields, overall they are conserved. So whatever flows away from some region must be flowing into some other region. In curved space-time, however, we do not have in general any translation invariance. Not in space, not in time. Instead, space-time is bumpy. In space, and it can also shrink or expand in time. So there is no time or space translation invariance. And what that means is that we should expect that the flows of energy and momentum will be there, but not conserved. Can't be that suddenly there is no flow of energy or no flow of momentum. No, no, they're still there. They're just not conserved. There's an interplay between curvature and, and energy uh, and, and, and matter. So what we need to do is identify those flows of energy and momentum, even though they are not conserved, and find out under which conditions they are conserved, or approximately conserved. Here is the basic idea. Whatever plays the role of energy and momentum flows in curved space-time, must be very sensitive to changes in the space-time geometry. You see, we need an idea like this because ordinarily, in, in special relativity, energy and momentum were arrived at by the very property that they are conserved. The notion of energy was only invented because it was found that something is being conserved. And similarly with momentum. Nobody would have been interested in the expression one-half mv squared if it weren't conserved for a free particle. But in general relativity, we have to start from scratch because these things are not conserved. We cannot simply say energy is what is conserved under because of time translation, because there is no time translation invariant. So how can we identify what the flows of energy and momentum are given that they're not going to be conserved. Well, we know that they're going to be very sensitive to changes in the curvature. Because no curvature means it's conserved. As soon as there's curvature, we are messing with that. So what comes to mind is that we take what we have, which is the action, and check how it is changing when we change the space-time. 
when we make it curve, when we change its curvature, we're going to get something that will have something to do with the energy and momentum. What it will have to do with energy and momentum, we'll find out. <clears throat> so the definition is, we're going to look at the functional derivative of the action of all our matter fields with respect to uh, changes now in the metric. We know that energy and momentum will be very sensitive to this. So let's calculate that. This is going to be a tensor with two upper indices because, um, or it's going to be something with two upper indices because we are differentiating with respect to something that has two lower indices. And this thing is symmetric, so that thing will be symmetric as well. Um, I'm using this capital tau here. Uh, it's nothing to do with the torsion though. Remember, this is now general relativity and we are assuming that there is no torsion. In any case, the torsion tensor would have had one upper index and two lower indices. This is a different animal here. It has two upper indices. Actually, we will find out it's not actually a tensor, but almost. Um, so we define this object here. It's a functional derivative of the action with respect to the metric. What does that mean, functional derivative with respect to the metric? <coughs> we'll do that in a complete analogy to how we define the, fu the functional derivatives with respect to fields, to physical fields, to matter fields. So we say that uh, g mu nu of lambda and x is a deformation or a variation of the metric for positions in a finite region B, if, in complete analogy to what we did with physical fields earlier, if when lambda is equal to zero, we are not deforming the metric at all, and then as lambda is not equal to zero, we are allowing the metric to change in a smooth fashion, so it can grow bumps and ripples and so on and dents, but we require that we are not deforming the metric outside the region B. So for all x in the manifold but not in the finite region B, <coughs> we are requiring the metric to be unperturbed. So what we are doing is we are perturbing the metric in a finite region. And then we also write del G for dG by d lambda, where dG by d lambda is just straightforwardly the ordinary derivative of the metric with respect to its perturbation parameter lambda. Now, there's something important that we need to keep in mind with this. As we change the metric, we may be changing the shape of the space-time manifold, but we may also not. Because remember that some metrics, g mu nu of x and t, may look different from other metrics g mu of x and t, but really describe the same Riemannian structure, or pseudo-Riemannian structure. They may, two different metrics, two different looking metrics, may be related simply by a change of coordinates, by an isometric diffeomorphism. And so when we perturb our matrix valued function g mu nu of x, with the parameter lambda, it could be that we're changing the matrix in a way that can be absorbed by a change of coordinates. So not all of those variations actually describe variations of the manifold. We can use this to describe bumps and dents that grow in, in the manifold, but we can also um, change g mu nu of x without changing the Riemannian structure at all. And we can also do a mix, and that will be the generic case, where part of what we do is changing the shape, and part of what we do is not changing the shape. Let's keep that in mind, that some of what we do here is mere change of coordinates, and other things are actual change of shape of the manifold. Now, we say that a an action is functionally differentiable with respect to the metric in the region B if this derivative, namely the derivative of the action with respect to um, 
the parameter lambda exists for all smooth deformations um, of the metric. And then we obtain um, this expression, ds by d lambda is um, an expression uh, tau mu nu of x times um, the variation of the metric. And remember that the variation of the metric is just dg by d lambda. So this is really just a chain rule. Again, it's ds by dg, dg by d lambda. And the ds by dg we write as the tau. And um, the dg by d lambda we write as del g. I'm writing it in this way because this is how you will usually find it in books, but I just wanted to spell out what these things actually are if you want to do it explicitly. So the, um, the action is uh, called functionally dif uh, differentiable with respect to the metric. Um, if this expression exists and we can express this in this way. So it's, um, this is the, so, so to speak, the coefficient um, of that variation. Um, so we then write that ds by dg mu nu is one half of tau mu nu of x. Um, I'm spelling this out with this, with all this detail to highlight that in principle this doesn't really fix the tau. The functional derivative of the action with respect to the metric is not unique. The reason is that the functional derivative with respect to the metric is a derivative with respect to perturbations of a covariant symmetric two tensor. And the perturbations are themselves symmetric. See, if we should have highlighted that, all those perturbations of the metric are to be such that even if lambda is not zero, the metric stays symmetric. Otherwise, we cannot use it to describe the manifold, the Riemannian manifold, right? So for lambda, this is still to be a symmetric matrix so that we still have uh, a pseudo Riemannian manifold. But what that means is that the functional derivative with respect to the symmetric expression here um, gives us a tau mu nu, which is um, whose anti-symmetric part is not determined. We could define the tau mu nu to have an anti-symmetric part, and that would not disturb that relationship, because this is symmetric. The convention is to set the anti-symmetric part equal to zero. Um, because then we obtain an object, a symmetric expression t mu nu, which is directly the one that will go into the Einstein equation later. It will have to match an expression to do with the curvature, which is naturally symmetric. So an anti-symmetric term could be still had in here, but it would not, it could not be used in the Einstein equation. Um, okay, so we defined the functional derivative of the action with respect to the metric. And remember, the action is the action of all matter fields and only the matter fields. We don't have a gravity action just yet. It's only the action of the matter fields. Now, tau mu nu is not a tensor. But why is it not? Re let's rewrite um, the integral. So ds by d lambda is this expression here. But let's look at the tensor structure of this expression. We have here a square root of g if we also divide by a square root of g. Then if we put it in this way, we see that this is just a volume form. And we see that this is a tensor, right? Because the metric is a tensor, its perturbations are tensorial. Therefore, this thing must be a tensor. So what we see now is that tau itself wasn't a tensor, 
tau multiplied with 1 over square root of g, that is a tensor. And remember that under change of coordinates, if you look at it from the physicist point of view, under change of coordinates, this transforms non-trivially. So it really matters that this factor is required to make all of this a tensor. Um, we therefore introduce a definition. We say that um, if this is a tensor, then uh, if, if M is a tensor, then a curly M defined as the tensor multiplied with square root of G, that is then called a tensor density. You see, this whole thing is a tensor. If you multiply with square root of G, you get this object. And that is then not a tensor, it's what is called a tensor density. So what you see is that you have to divide a tensor density by square root of g in order to get an actual tensor. And when we do that, when we take the tau mu nu and divide it by square root of g, then we obtain a tensor. And that tensor is 2 over square root of g, um, functional derivative of the action. That tensor will be called the energy momentum tensor. Now, here's an important proposition. The proposition that the energy momentum tensor that we just defined, which is, no, let me keep it up a little longer. So the energy momentum tensor that we just defined, which is the functional derivative of the action with respect to the metric, and then divided by square root of g. And proposition is that this energy momentum tensor has the property that when you take the covariant derivative and then contract it, that is equal to zero. This is not a divergence. If this were having only if this object only had one upper index, then this would be the divergence. But it doesn't. It has two upper indices. This is therefore not a divergence. Um, now, why would that equation hold true? See, it looks like an equation of motion. Or, I mean, it looks like something important. And it looks almost like a conservation law. Now, it is actually important, but it's not a conservation law. And it's not an equation of motion. It's actually one of those equations that have to be true no matter what. If you're cooking up new laws of nature, you're not going to get around this one. And the reason is that this is the expression of the fact that in the definition of the energy momentum tensor, we are doing some non-physical things. We are differentiating the action with respect to changes in the metric, some of which do not change the manifold. And remember that some of the delta G could be absorbed by change of coordinates. And these are flat directions, so to speak. If you change the metric in such a way that you're not changing the manifold, then you're not changing the physics of it. So you have some redundancy in the definition of the energy momentum tensor. Some of the derivatives are dummy derivatives. They don't really express a change. They're not really due to a change of shape. And that leads to a redundancy in the information encoded in T mu nu. And that redundancy is expressed in the validity of those equations, no matter what. We will prove that, but a little later. For now, let's remember it and let's use it. But later on, we prove that from the diffeomorphism invariance. I mean, from, um, from the fact that, um, well, what, what, did we, what we just discussed. OK. So we define the team you knew with the aim of identifying flows of energy and momentum that are associated with matter fields. Let us start with a case. Let us consider cases where space-time actually has a symmetry of translation, either in space or in time, and therefore where we expect that there is a conservation law. 
So consider a manifold which is like a vase, for example. This could be made out of glass, and it's a vase. It has a rotational symmetry. And there is a diffeomorphism phi that maps these, this point of the vase into that point, that point into this point, and so on. So we are assuming that the, the thing has an exact rotational symmetry, and therefore this diffeomorphism is an isometric diffeomorphism. It maps the manifold into the manifold, and it maps the metric into the metric. We expect that in this case, when we have a symmetry like that, an isometric diffeomorphism, then we expect a conservation law. Let's, say, let's see how this conservation law is related to how it arises and how it might be related to the energy momentum tensor. See, so far we have no indication why we should call this the energy momentum tensor at all. It's just a functional derivative of the action with respect to the metric. Okay, so we start with the definition. We call any vector field psi, uh, which is non-vanishing in the region, in some region B in the manifold, a killing vector field if the lead derivative of the metric in the direction of the vector field is vanishing. You see, here we have that the metric doesn't change as we move from here to here. The shape of the manifold doesn't change as we rotate the whole thing. So under this isometric um, diffeomorphism, uh, the metric doesn't change. Well, that's why it's called isometric. And that is what this expression, what this equation expresses infinitesimally. It says that under an infinitesimal diffeomorphism generated by the vector field psi, the metric doesn't change. That's what the lead derivative is, right? It's telling you how a tensor changes under an infinitesimal diffeomorphism generated by the vector field psi. So if the metric is not changing under the action of um, an infinitesimal diffeomorphism generated by a vector field psi, then we call this a killing vector field. How can we find killing vector fields? Um, for metric connections, and these are the only ones that we are considering now in general relativity, um, the lead derivative can be expressed in this way. This is again an instance of going into the origin of a Riemann normal coordinate system and then turning commas into semicolons. Why? The lead derivative, if you go back a few lectures, we defined to be, or it came out to be from the axioms of it being a derivation and so on, we found that the lead derivative acting on tensors is given by this. You differentiate the coefficient functions of the tensor with respect to k, but not a semicolon, just an ordinary comma. And then you had these additional terms here where you differentiated um, the, um, uh, the direction vector field psi. And for every covariant index or contravariant index, you had either a plus or a minus sign there. But this equation held true with commas. Now I'm saying that this equation is also true with semicolons. And it's true with semicolons because at the origin of a Riemann normal coordinate system, um, this equation we knew held with commas, because we know it holds always with commas. And at the origin of a Riemann normal coordinate system, commas and semicolons are the same, because the gammas are vanishing. Therefore, at the origin of a Riemann normal coordinate system, this equation holds with the semicolon. But now it's covariant. And if it holds in any coordinate system, it holds in all coordinate systems. So we can write the lead derivative in this form as well, which will come in handy because when we apply the lead derivative to the metric, then um, when the covariant derivatives of the metric arise, that's good, because we know that it's vanishing. The covariant derivative of the metric is vanishing. Right? Remember, that was the consistency condition between affine connection and metric. The covariant derivative of the metric is vanishing. It's expressing that under parallel transport, 
angles and lengths of vectors don't change. OK, this is just what I said. OK, so now let's apply this. Let's calculate the lead derivative of the metric. Lead derivative of the metric. Covariant derivative of the coefficient function plus, and then we have the derivatives of the direction vector field. And this is vanishing, right? Because that was the condition that fixed the levi civita connection. So we have that the lead derivative of the metric vanishing is the same as saying that this expression is vanishing, you know, just the remaining two terms, sum up to zero. Now we can use the metric to pull that index down. And so the condition for a vector, for a vector field to be a killing vector field is simply this one. If you covariantly differentiate it with respect to nu, you get minus if you do the same thing with the swapped indices. And that is just a bunch of differential equations. And you can just check whether for a given space-time there exist solutions to that uh, set of differential equations. So now let's assume that space-time has a symmetry described by a killing vector field. It may have several killing vector fields. It may have no killing vector fields. Our actual space-time has no killing vector fields. But with very good approximation, it has some killing vector fields, but not exactly. So if there is a killing vector field, then we expect that because we then have some translation symmetry, there ought to be some conservation law. What would that be? Here's the proposition. Um, for every symmetry, so for every killing vector field psi that the space-time processes, its matter fields possess a conserved quantity, which flows according to the vector field, p mu, which is defined in this way. So you take the energy momentum tensor that you calculated for the matter field, and then you contract it with the killing vector field. You obtain a four vector field, p mu. And that four vector field is going to be, uh, uh, that has a um, conservation law. Let's check. So we calculate p mu, semicolon mu, covariant derivative, contracted. What is that then? Well, by definition, the p mu is this contraction. So we take this, covariant derivative in the mu direction. By the Leibniz rule for covariant differentiation, this means we have to covariantly differentiate this piece, leaving that the same plus the other way around. So we get the covariant derivative of the energy momentum tensor, leaving the xi, the killing vector, the same, plus leaving the energy momentum tensor the same, and then covariantly differentiating the uh, killing vector field. Now, the covariant derivative of the energy momentum tensor um, contracted over one of its indices is zero. That's the equation that arises from a diffeomorphism invariance, if you remember. Oof, where is it? Here. This is still a task we have to do. We still have to prove this. Um, and remember, this is always true, whether or not there is a symmetry. It's just because there are always metrics that look different, but they only differ by a change of coordinates. OK, so. We take the energy momentum tensor, and if there's a killing vector field, we contract it. We get a vector field P mu. And that vector field P mu describes a conserved current in the following sense. We take the uh, semicolon of it. And that will translate into a divergence. Um, so this is the T mu times the killing vector field semicolon product rule. This term is vanishing, as we just saw. And the other term here is of this structure. We have T mu nu is symmetric, but the killing vector field is anti-symmetric. Psi nu semicolon mu is anti-symmetric. Why? It's the condition for a vector field to be a killing vector field. It arose from this. The covariant derivative, sorry, the lead derivative of the metric is vanishing 
Well, this term goes away anyway because the covariant derivative of the metric is always vanishing. And then the sum of these two terms has to vanish, which is to say that you can use the metric to pull down those indices. So you get just this equation here, anti-symmetry. And that anti-symmetry makes also the second term goes away, go away. So we have that this expression is equal to 0. Let's integrate that. Um, if we now integrate this expression, which is vanishing, so then we have 0 is equal to this integral here. Here we have just the volume form. But remember that this was uh, an exercise of the previous lecture, that p mu semicolon mu times the volume form is the divergence of that vector field p. And by Gauss's theorem, that's the integral over just the boundary of um, the inner derivation p applied to uh, the volume form. That's because the lead derivative, if you, if you remember, the divergence can be expressed as a lead derivative. The lead derivative is the anti-commutator of the, inter, the inner and the exterior derivation. And <coughs> only the interior survives there. You have di and the d goes away with Stokes' theorem. OK, so what that means is that um, this overall integral over the boundary is equal to 0, which means that whatever goes into that region B also comes out of the region B. So we have a conservation law. Now, a definition. If the killing vector field Xi is time-like, then it generates a time-like translation. We have, therefore, a translation invariance in a time coordinate. And we then describe the flow. We call the flow, which is conserved with this vector field, uh, an energy. If the vector field Xi is space-like, then we say it is a momentum that is conserved. And of course, in Minkowski space, that reduces to the usual notions of energy and momentum. So that's why it makes sense to call the T mu nu the energy momentum tensor of fields. We see that in the case of symmetries, translation symmetries, um, its contraction with the direction of the symmetry, the killing vectors, gives us a conserved quantity. And when there is no killing vector field, then we still get flows, but they're just not conserved. What we saw here is the flow of energy and momentum for physical fields. Now, physical fields can be everywhere, right? So like an electron wave function or a photon uh, field can be spread out arbitrarily much. But what about point particles? What about the energy and momentum of a point particle instead of a field? It turns out that then again, killing vector fields are the key. Assume that our space-time possesses a killing vector field. And let's assume that our particle travels on a geodesic gamma. Then we can define the contraction of the killing vector field with the tangent of our particle. The particle is traveling on the geodesic gamma. Gamma dot is the tangent vector to the geodesic. It's a tangent vector. Uh, it's a cotangent vector. And the xi mu is a tangent vector. We can contract them, and we get a scalar quantity, q. It turns out that this quantity is conserved along the travels of our particles, uh, our particle gamma. And the quantity that is being conserved, this q, is called either an energy or momentum, depending on whether the xi uh, is space-like or time-like. Let's prove this. So we take this contraction here, the killing vector field, with the uh, tangent vector to the geodesic, and differentiate it along the path. Now, um, let's 
describe the tangent vector. Let's call the tangent vector no longer gamma dot. Let's call it u. Then let us calculate the, um, the, the, the quantity q is the contraction between the killing vector field and the tangent vector of our particle. That's the scalar quantity. So u is the gamma dot. I don't know. I could have kept the gamma dot, but you know the dot indicates the derivative, and we're not really um, needing that. So that's the tangent vector to a geodesic. And we are differentiating now that scalar quantity of which we want to show a conservation law. Let's differentiate that with respect to the time along the path. So the, we calculate the derivative in the direction of u. I'm writing it here as a covariant derivative. But really, it's just the ordinary derivative. It's just d by dt, really. d by dt, where t is the parameter along the geodesic, or d by d tau, tau is the parameter along the geodesic. It's just the ordinary derivative because this is a scalar. But the ordinary derivative on a scalar is really the same as the covariant derivative. And it makes sense to use that trick of writing it as a covariant derivative in the direction of the time variable, the direction of the geodesic, because we know that the covariant derivative obeys a Leibniz rule on curved space. So we know that the covariant derivative in the time direction of this scalar quantity is the covariant derivative in the time direction of this quantity. I'm just spelling out this thing in coefficients now. So we have the scalar quantity covariantly differentiated in the directions k and then contracted with the uk, which is giving us the direction in which we have to covariantly differentiate, then by the Leibniz rule, we covariantly differentiate this product by differentiating them individually. So the UK is just carried forward. <clears throat> here we have a derivative of the xi, covariant derivative of the xi, leaving the u the same. And here um, we covariantly differentiate the u and leaving the xi the same, and the UK is just carried forward. Now, <clears throat> Let's see, this term goes away because we have a product of two u's, uk and u mu, and that's symmetric. But this expression is anti-symmetric in the two indices because if you remember, that was the condition for a vector field to be a killing vector field, namely that it is anti-symmetric in its two indices. And here, it's not a matter of anti-symmetry. Here, it's a matter of taking the tangent vector and covariantly differentiating it in the direction of the tangent vector. That's vanishing for a geodesic, right? Because the tangent vector for a geodesic is parallel transported. So that's vanishing too, and therefore that's conserved, and therefore this scalar quantity is conserved along the path of a geodesic. So now we see how the killing how a killing vector field induces a conserved flow of energy and momentum or momentum um, for a physical field and also how it induces conserved energy and momentum for a particle that travels on a geodesic now we still have to show that this is true we used it already several times but why is it true That equation was, by the way, very important for Einstein um, when he had to guess what the right equations for general relativity might be for the dynamics of, of space-time. So the intuition is that, the intuition for why such equations hold is that many variations of the metric, as we discussed earlier, are not actually changing the manifold. They are not changing the Riemannian or pseudo-Riemannian structure because this metric might be just the same as this one up to a change of coordinates. So it looks like we've done something, but we have not really changed anything. So the problem is that the expression for the energy momentum tensor it depends on all those variations, even the trivial ones. So we expect the team you knew to not be containing just clean information. It also is diluted. There is some redundancy in the team you knew. But how much redundancy do we expect there to be in team you knew? Well, we can calculate that. 
diffeomorphism invariance, that is the freedom to relabel the point, um, is given by four functions namely the four new coordinates of space and time expressed in terms of the four old coordinates of space and time. The new coordinate system might be consisting of the barred variables, the old coordinate system of the unbarred variables. There's four functions, free, four freely choosable functions. Therefore, we expect that four equations should hold which express the redundancy in T mu nu of X. And those four equations turn out to be these four equations. You see, if you con after you contract the new index, there's one index left, mu, running from one to four. It's four non-trivial equations, and they express, they arise just from this diffeomorphism invariance. Let's prove this. Um, so let's assume that phi t is a diffeomorphism of the manifold that is generated um, by the flow of some vector field Xi. And let's assume that um, the diffeomorphism is changing coordinates only in a finite patch. And the vector field that generates the diffeomorphism actually vanishes outside that. So now the diffeomorphism um, is just the identity diffeomorphism outside a certain region, but inside the region B it is actually changing the coordinate system a little bit. Now, every integral, including the actual integral, is always invariant under change of variable. And no matter what it is, no matter what the physics about it is, but if you take an integral and you just change variables in it, you're not changing the value of the integral. And that is what this diffeomorphism does. It's just changing variables. And we are going to look at an infinitesimal uh, diffeomorphism at that. So let us look at the action in a certain region. We have the Lagrangian um, that we Lagrangian density that we integrate over. It depends on the matter fields, it depends on the covariant derivatives of the matter fields, and it depends on the metric. And whether we express all of this in unbarred variables or in barred variables makes no difference. It's just a change of variables, just a change of coordinate system. So in particular, if we take the difference between the two, where this is simply the image under the diffeomorphism phi of that, if we take the difference between the two and divide by t, then it's still zero. But you see, as we let t go to zero, as we let the, the um, the parameter of the diffeomorphism go to zero as we let the diffeomorphism go to the identity. This is still going to zero, which is eventually turning into the first derivative. This is turning into the lead derivative then. So let's expand um, these expressions. Um, right, so to, so to first order, what do we get? We have the L by the Psi, the change of L with respect to Psi, times the change in Psi, plus the L by the G, and the change in G. Now, the L by the Psi to first order, we are assuming now that the equations of motion hold, then the L by the Psi integrated over, that is equal to zero. Right? That's just the Euler-Lagrange equation. So that goes away, which is convenient. But we have the change of L with respect to the metric, and change of the metric as we go from writing the action in one coordinate system to writing the action in a slightly different coordinate system. So this would be the change in the appearance of the metric just because we change coordinate system infinitesimally. And here we have the dl by dg. The 
And remember that the L by dg is up to a prefactor of square root of g, just the energy momentum tensor. So what we have is that 0 equal 2, and then we have here this 1 over t, and then we have the energy momentum tensor here, and here we have the change of the metric. As we take the limit for t going to 0, we obtain the lead derivative. The lead derivative is the first, first order change as we apply a an infinitesimal diffeomorphism. So this equation here, um, that equation becomes simply that 0 equal to 1 half energy momentum tensor square root of g and the lead derivative of the metric. So here's the energy momentum tensor up to a prefactor of square root of g. And here is the change in the metric. Change in the metric divided by t, limit t going to 0. This was by the geometric definition of the lead derivative that we did a few lectures back. This is the definition of the lead derivative. So that's how we get the lead derivative here. Now, <coughs> let's work out the lead derivative on the metric. The lead derivative applied to the metric is given by the sum of these three terms. And remember that originally we had this with commas, but as we argued half an hour ago, um, it's also true with semicolons, because that's the covariant version of the equation. But the covariant derivative of the metric is vanishing. That's, the, that's because of the consistency condition between the affine connection and the metric. And so the lead derivative is 0 plus the sum of these two terms. So let's plug that in there. So instead of the lead derivative, let's plug in those two terms. Then we have that this equation becomes 0 equal to energy momentum tensor, just carry it forward. And then uh, the lead derivative becomes the sum of these two terms. And I move the square root of g from here to there where it belongs with the, with the volume form, to, to form the volume form. Now, um, the energy momentum tensor is symmetric in its two indices. Um, and here we have the sum of two um, covariant derivatives of the vector that generates the diffeomorphism, that generates the infinitesimal diffeomorphism. And uh, we get here this uh, symmetric uh, expression, simply two times the, uh, the um, covariant derivative of the vector field psi in the a direction. In principle, there's also an anti-symmetric part. It's written here. But the anti-symmetric part, I mean, I can write this as that plus an anti-symmetric part. But the anti-symmetric part doesn't contribute to the integral because this thing is symmetric. So the anti-symmetric part just gets projected out. Therefore, we can write this expression here simply with using only one of these two terms with a factor 2 in front. That gives us. 2 times TAB, and then that expression here. OK. Um, right. Um, some more gymnastics here. Uh, so then we add a term, and we subtract a term. So we just carried forward this term here, and then we add this term, and we subtract that term. The point is that the sum of those two terms is a total covariant derivative. Because you see here, it's the t that's being um, covariantly differentiated, and here it's the xi that's being covariantly differentiated. So it's overall the covariant derivative of the product of the two. And this term is left over. And you recognize that this is, in effect, an integration by parts that we do here. We produce a boundary term and a term where the derivative is sitting on the other side. So this term is not going to contribute. Why? Um, well, define 
this vector here, the T contracted with the Xi, this vector here, we have that this is a divergence, and the divergence is vanishing because our Xi is vanishing at the boundary of our region B. This is because we set it up in such a way that our diffeomorphism is changing coordinates only inside the region B, but outside it leaves everything the same. Outside and on the boundary it leaves everything the same. So Xi is vanishing on the boundary, so therefore that's vanishing. First term, the boundary term goes away. I mean, this is a volume integral, but it becomes a boundary integral because this is a divergence, and that is vanishing. Therefore, finally, we arrive at the conclusion that um, this expression is equal to zero, but it is equal to zero for all diffeomorphisms. We can choose whichever vector field we want to generate the diffeomorphisms. So that is to be true for all Xi, and therefore this thing itself has to vanish inside, and that is the condition that that is the equation that we want to wanted to derive. Or these are the four equations that we wanted to derive. And as you can see, these equations are indeed a consequence of the diffeomorphism invariance of um, of the action. Simply the fact that you can write the action in whichever coordinate system you want. Okay, but then how can we calculate the energy momentum tensor um, um, in practice? So remember that the action is always an expression in terms of the matter fields and the first covariant derivatives of the matter field. Then the, covariant, then the derivative of the action with respect to the metric. Remember, now we need to differentiate with, this, with respect to the net metric. Not like in the previous lecture where we differentiated with respect to the matter. Now we need to differentiate with respect to the metric in order to get the energy momentum tensor. Um, then we are going to differentiate that and get all these terms. There is going to be a direct dependence of the Lagrangian with, um, on, on G, and that gives us a term. We also have um, to differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to the matter fields. And then we differentiate the matter fields with respect to changes in the metric, but, but they're independent. So we are not varying the matter fields here. So this term is absent, therefore. I mean, this term is, is zero, therefore the whole thing is vanishing. We are only varying with respect to the metric. We are not varying with respect to the matter fields. So the delta psi is vanishing. But I'm still putting the term here and then argue that it's vanishing because a similar looking term is not vanishing. We have to be very careful. Um, it's easily the source of mistakes. So, uh, yeah, and then we get a term where we have a dependence of um, the metric in the action through this. You see, there's dependence on the metric in here, but there's also dependence in the metric on here. So we also have to differentiate the square root of g with respect to the metric. And um, the derivative of the square root of the absolute value of the determinant of g turns out to be 1 half g a b square root of g. So a little calculation to, to verify that. Uh, if you want an exercise, that is a nice exercise. So that's this term. And then here comes a term that is easily overlooked. Namely, if we vary the action with respect to the metric, then we also have to consider, by the chain rule, the variation of the Lagrangian with respect to the covariant derivative of the field. And then we have to, ver we have to calculate, by the chain rule, the derivative of the covariant derivative of the field with respect to the metric. And you might think, Hmm. Well, as we just said here, we are not varying the field, so that ought to be vanishing. But the thing is that it's true that we are not varying the field, but the covariant derivative of a field has the metric in it. The covariant derivative of the field has the affine connection in it. Therefore, 
as we vary the metric, we are automatically also varying the covariant derivative of the field. Therefore, this, in principle, can give us a contribution. We have to be careful there. OK, so. Um, <clears throat> Um, yes, yeah, so the point is that the variation with respect to the metric of the covariant derivative of the metaphase is generally not, e not even to zero, even though the variation of the field itself is zero. And that's because the semicolon contains the affine connection. And if the variation of the metric is not zero, then the variation of the uh, uh, affine connection is also not zero. So we have to vary the covariant derivative of the matter field. We can do that by varying the matter fields with respect to the affine connection, and then vary the affine connection with respect to the metric. So the affine connection is itself not a, a tensor. But remember from the beginning of the previous lecture, changes in the affine connection are tensorial. Remember, the argument was, we asked the question, could it be that there are two gravities? Could it be that there is an affine connection gamma and there's an affine connection gamma tilde? And there are really two gravities. And then we said, kind of, yeah, could be. But the difference between the two is tensorial. So we might as well just say there's one gravity and an extra tensor field. And from that, we also deduce that when we vary with respect to affine connections, the variation, the delta of a gamma, is tensorial. So this is a, a tensorial, and what it is, is this. Um, remember, that without the, the variation symbol, that would also be uh, a true equation, without the variation symbol there. And then um, with the variation, you just get that. Um, it's easiest to prove by going in, uh, into the, uh, to the origin of a geodesic coordinate system. OK, so then. Um, the variation of the matter fields with respect to, uh, sorry, the, we calculate the variation of the covariant derivative of matter fields with respect to the metric. We obtain d psi by d gamma, and then multiply it with d gamma by d g, and that is this. Now we want to integrate by parts so that we don't have the delta acting on the g, but on the left-hand side there. Um, so we, have, um, we want to calculate the variation of the covariant derivatives of the field, um, so that it becomes a multiple of the, uh, the metric. And um, this turns out to be, and uh, I'll leave it to you as an exercise to um, plug this in, um, the variation of the action with respect to the metric parameterized by lambda is then given by this expression here. And from that, we can then um, read off what the energy momentum tensor is. So for example, you could do that for the Klein-Gordon field. Um, then you get a particular um, uh, Lagrangian, and you can work through all those things. And then you can um, read off exactly, I mean, you work out these things, and you get exactly, you can then read off exactly what the energy momentum tensor is. So here's an example. Um, for a Klein Gordon field, this is the action. Um, maybe written in a slightly unusual way, but you probably have seen this before. If this, are, if, if this is Minkowski space, then these are ordinary derivatives, and you simply have the action of the Klein-Gordon field being d mu psi, d, or d a psi, d b psi, g a b, which is just the usual Danumbertian. Um, I mean, after an integration by parts, it becomes psi Danumbertian psi. Here you have the potential of a Klein-Gordon field and square root of g. And this could also be a mass term, could also be an m squared psi squared term. And the covariant version of that is, of course, simply with covariant derivatives here. 
then we can calculate what the uh, energy momentum tensor is of that field. So we differentiate the action, the Klein-Gordon action, with respect to, see, the Klein-Gordon action um, with respect to the metric uh, by by means by the means that we just discussed. Um, Um, <laughs> okay, so these are scalar fields. The semicolons um, can also be written as just ordinary commas because the covariant derivative on scalar functions are ordinary derivatives. Uh, so the variation now is, um, see, these don't have, with the commas, they don't have any dependence on the metric in them, but there's a dependence on the metric obviously in the metric. So it's a delta GAB, and leaving the square root of G the same. And the only other dependence of the action on the metric is here. So we get one more term when we differentiate the action with, the, with respect to the metric, namely integral, everything the same, but this one differentiated. Okay. So overall, the Klein-Gordon action has two occurrences of the metric, here and there. Therefore, the Klein-Gordon action differentiated with, the, with respect to the metric gives us two contributions. One contribution from differentiating this term with respect to the metric here, and one contribution differentiating that term with respect to the metric over there. Um, remember that the derivative of square root of the absolute value of the determinant of g with respect to, to g itself um, is given here. <clears throat> Another thing we need, because we need here the variation of the g with the upper indices, is that the variation of the contraction of g with itself is the variation of just the Kronecker delta. Right? Because GAB, GBC is just delta AC, but the variation of, of a constant is, is zero. So, but by the Leibniz rule, this is also the variation of GAB, uh, sorry, it's GAB times the variation of GBC plus the variation of GAB times GBC, the point being that this is a variation of G with upper indices. That's a variation of G with lower indices. That's the thing that we defined. Now we know that zero equal to the sum of these two. So we can deduce what the variation of a G with, an upper, with upper indices is. Let me just, the negative of the variation of the, varia uh, the variation of G with lower indices. <coughs> and if you plug all of these things in there, then we obtain this expression for the uh, variation of the Klein-Gordon action with respect to the metric, just collecting all the indices, uh, just collecting all the terms using how the variation of a metric with upper indices works, and using, uh, here it is, and using the variation of the square root of g. Okay, we get this expression here, and from the, this gives us the tau, right? The derivative of the action with respect to the metric gives us the tau. Tau is the energy momentum tensor density. And um, here it is. And the energy momentum tensor is given by that up to a factor of two and a square root of g. So the, uh, um, the energy momentum tensor density is given by this expression just from above here, and lots of those g's go away because we can use them to lower and raise indices. So that is the expression for the energy momentum tensor density. And finally, the energy momentum tensor for a scalar field, for a Klein-Gordon field, is then given in this way. Now that is important, and let us look at this uh, a little closely. So here we have derivative, derivative. It's a kinetic term, right? It's a um, um, kinetic term of the energy momentum tensor. Here as well, derivative, derivative, g mu nu. And this is the potential term. 
it is very important that the potential for a scalar field enters into the energy momentum tensor proportionally to the metric g mu nu. This is something special because spinner fields don't do that. Uh, vector fields like the electromagnetic field also don't do that. It's, cru it's going to be crucial for cosmology, absolutely important. The behavior that the a, uh, a scalar potential in a Klein-Gordon field enters in this way to the energy momentum tensor. The energy momentum tensor is a symmetric covariant two tensor. The metric is a symmetric covariant two tensor. Therefore, and since there is no other symmetric covariant two tensor in the game, the energy momentum tensor for a scalar field, the energy momentum tensor for a scalar field has to be the potential times this symmetric covariant two tensor. Right? The potential, it could not come out any differently. The exact prefactor we had to calculate. But my point is that for a scalar field, this is really unavoidable and very important that it is so. See, the potential has to enter the energy momentum tensor somehow, but it's a scalar. And how can you make, a, how can you make from a scalar a contribution to a covariant symmetric two tensor? Well, only by multiplying it with a metric, because that's a covariant symmetric two tensor as well. Okay. How about like uh, something from down to the uh, the, uh, the curvature? Um, In effect, that is the same thing as you will see. Um, remember that the, the cosmological constant can be viewed, I mean, this is now looking ahead, of course, to when we deal with the cosmological constant, but obviously lots of you have seen that already. It can be viewed as being part of the energy momentum tensor on the right-hand side of the Einstein equation, but you can also view it as being part of the curvature part on the left-hand side of the energy momentum tensor, as we will later to see. And this is what the potential does. It contributes effectively a cosmological constant, something that's proportional to the metric tensor. So you can view it as arising to the left-hand side as part of the curvature or part of the energy momentum tensor. But it's more naturally on the right-hand side with the energy momentum tensor. OK, but for now, let's just keep in mind that for a scalar, for a Klein-Gordon field, its potential, if it has a potential, it will contribute to the energy momentum tensor in a way that's proportional to the energy momentum tensor, I, uh, to the metric tensor. I'll show you in a moment why that's important. Let's contrast that with what we would get if we had done the calculation for the electromagnetic field. For the electromagnetic field, the energy momentum tensor looks like this. And um, uh, it's, a long, it's a longer calculation to calculate that. It's basically E squared plus B squared. Electric field squared plus magnetic field squared. Now, keep that structure here in mind uh, of, the, of the Klein-Gordon field. Kinetic terms and then terms uh, proportional to the metric. In cosmology, we consider the universe to be filled with something that we call a, a perfect fluid. Now, what are the particles in the fluid? It's, somewhat, and it's a sort of, it's a kind of unusual fluid because each particle of that fluid is not a hydrogen molecule or something. No, no, no. Each particle of that cosmological fluid is a galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> Rather big particles, right? <laughs> yes. Um, and, and that fluid is considered a perfect fluid. But what, what do we mean by perfect fluid? Okay, so a perfect classical fluid, at least in the terminology of cosmologies, is a fluid which has at every point a unique time-like flux direction vector, V mu, and some other conditions, but let me just say something about this. Imagine, um, it, what would be a non-perfect fluid, according to this already? You could have two gases which move through each other in different directions. Like 
the wind of air molecules going in one direction, but on the other hand, a flux of neutrinos going in another direction. They hardly ever interact. Now you have two gases that move through each other, as they actually do. And that wouldn't be a perfect fluid, because what is the velocity vector at a point? The air goes one way, the neutrinos go another way. <clears throat> so let's assume we have, in good approximation, a well-defined flux direction vector at every point. And let's assume that the flux is conserved and that the fluid is completely characterized by two numbers at every point, by its local energy density, mu, and by its local pressure. Um, we assume that there's no shear and there's no vi viscosity. Um, and the local energy density and the local pressure are as measured by a co-moving observer, for whom by co-moving observer, I mean an observer for which this time-like vector here has a non-zero zero coordinate, but the one, two, three coordinates are zero. Which is to say, according to that observer, the fluid has no spatial velocity. The fluid only moves in the time direction, but it's not having any spatial velocity. So an observer is locally observing this vector as having just a zero component, co-moving observer, relative to that observer, the fluid is at rest, and then the energy momentum tensor takes this form. It's diagonal, it has in its zero, zero components, the energy density, and then these components in the space dimensions. That's what makes it um, a perfect fluid, according to cosmologists. And the energy momentum tensor for perfect fluid is this. So, there is a pressure term, and then here is the velocity vector, and the energy density and the pressure contribute to that. Um, this is a consequence of, of that. You see, if you are a co-moving observer, this is your energy momentum tensor. It's the diagonal matrix with mu p, p, p as its entries on the diagonal. If you covariantize that so that it's true in all coordinate systems, I mean, if this is true in a covariant, in a, uh, for a co-moving observer, then for an arbitrary observer, this is the energy momentum tensor. So there's nothing fancy that goes into this. If you, you choose B to be the vector with components 1, 0, 0, 0, well, then this becomes just that matrix over there. And it turns out that the equation of motion then for this perfect fluid is simply the equation that t mu nu semicolon nu equal to zero. Which is, in the case that there's no pressure in there, it is, um, I call it a dust, and that dust would travel on geodesics according to that equation here. Now you may wonder, why are we dealing with fluids now? Um, um, I'm getting to this just a sec. So, okay, the terminology is that any um, any fluid which has an energy momentum tensor of this form will be called a perfect fluid. Um, and the prime example of that is galaxies. And the galaxies can be viewed as as a dust. There's no pressure. See, they, they are not... Um, um, the, 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 the galaxy gas is just like a gas of, uh, of little particles that are moving there in isolation. But there are other gases in cosmology that would have a pressure. For example, a photon gas would have a pressure. A very important um, um, quantity to... Um, that characterizes the behavior of uh, perfect uh, fluids is the ratio between the energy density and the pressure. Of course, we want, we want to know both, but the ratio between the two has a particular role to play. In cosmology. So, <clears throat> the equation of state of a perfect fluid is the relationship between its energy density and its pressure. 
And that relationship can be highly non-trivial. It can change over time. Um, it depends on um, the properties of the fluid in question. You know, when you have a fluid, you might compress it and have a particular relationship between energy density and pressure. But then maybe the fluid starts to condense. It goes in, it, it does a phase transition. And after the phase transition, it's another kind of fluid with another relationship between um, the, the pressure and the energy density. And the same is, that, that is um, expected to have, is thought to have happened in the universe several times. That it underwent several phase transitions from very early in the universe until later. And after each phase transition, you have a new relationship between the pressure and energy density. And we will get to talk about this, and these phase transitions, of course, in more detail later on. But for now, let's just keep in mind that at any moment, at any point in time, a number that is quite indicative of what is going on with the gases in the universe is the relationship between pressure and energy density. And that ratio between the two is called the equation of state constant, the equation of state constant W. But it's not a constant, right? It changes over time. It's just a, it's an equation of state parameter. Now, why did I switch from the energy momentum tensor of the Klein-Gordon field suddenly to the energy momentum tensor of a perfect fluid? It turns out they have a lot in common. And that's not accidental, and it's crucial for cosmology. Let us look at the Klein-Gordon energy momentum tensor. This is it again. Kinetic terms, and there is the potential term that's proportional to the metric. And then here we have the energy momentum tensor of a perfect fluid. Anything that, any fluid that has this type of energy momentum tensor is called a perfect fluid. And you see that there's a similarity between the two. The similarity is particularly strong if we assume that, there, that the space derivatives of psi are small. Let's assume that the, the, uh, the time derivatives of our Klein-Gordon field dominates over the space derivatives. This is quite often um, a good assumption. What it means is that in the early universe, the, the action was in time, not in space. That the early universe was pretty much homogeneous. The space derivatives were small. No, it was always, it, it, things were happening the same way everywhere. But over time, things were really happening. Things were, you know, the universe was expanding very quickly and gases were diluting and so on. So the time derivative was important. But we had almost spatial homogeneity, so the spatial derivatives were very small. So we're assuming here that the time derivative is dominant, the space derivatives are subdominant. In this case, you see that these time derivatives are similar to these things here, because these are time-like vectors. And then what we have is time-like vectors here, time-like vectors there, and the rest is multiplying with g mu nu. So let's make a definition. Let's make a relationship between these and those. Let us define for a Klein-Gordon field, which is you know, a quantum field, of course. Um, let's define for a, a Klein-Gordon field, such as the intraton field, a vector phi, a v as if it were um, a perfect fluid. It's not a perfect fluid, of course, not a fluid at all. Klein-Gordon field may have only one particle in it, after all, or no particle. It could be just a vacuum of, of the Klein-Gordon field. Um, but let us take the energy momentum tensor of a Klein-Gordon field and let us define out of psi a vector v mu. And, you know, just straightforward definition, and this is just a normalization factor here so that um, v mu, v mu is normalized to minus 1. They're both time-like anyway. So then, the Klein-Gordon um, energy momentum tensor, 
the klein Gordon energy momentum tensor can then be written as g mu nu and then the uh, covariant derivatives, then v mu, v, v nu, g mu nu, some stuff. And with the assumption that really only the time derivatives contribute and the space derivatives are small, this simply becomes the square of the time derivatives. So what we have is here the square of the time derivatives, v mu, v nu, plus g mu nu times scalar stuff. Right here again, we assume that the time derivatives dominate over the space derivatives. We have just that. And now we can compare this expression here with what we have for perfect fluid. And that gives us then a dictionary that is very important if you want to understand cosmological uh, cosmology talks, because they always speak of um, Klein-Gordon fields as if they were fluids, and fluids sometimes as if they were Klein-Gordon fields. So <clears throat> here is the energy momentum tensor of a perfect fluid. Here we have the energy momentum tensor of a Klein-Gordon field. And now we can read off what mu and p are, and in particular, what the ratio is between the two. And um, what we find is that, um, you know, let me not go through the, uh, all, the, all the details of it. What we find is that the, uh, um, the ratio between the pressure and the uh, energy density, omega, or W, and the and the in, or the the, um, the inverse of it, the ratio between the energy density and the pressure, is given by this expression here, just by comparing the two energy momentum tensors. And overall, we end up with this particular final expression here. And this comes up a lot. It relates. A property of perfect fluids to a property of Klein-Gordon fields. For perfect fluids, W is the ratio between pressure and energy density. For Klein-Gordon fields, this is the kinetic term here, and that's the potential. And what we see here is that when for Klein-Gordon field, the potential is small, then this ratio goes to 1. So a Klein-Gordon field will behave for small potentials. A Klein-Gordon field will behave like a perfect fluid as far as GR is concerned, because GR only cares about energy and momentum. It doesn't care about any other properties of matter. right? So for small potential, the Klein-Gordon field will have an energy momentum tensor with a ratio between pressure and energy density that approaches 1. It will behave like a perfect fluid with, um, with um, equation of state parameter 1. If, on the other hand, the Klein-Gordon field has a very large value of the potential, maybe only temporarily, such as very early in the universe during inflation, if, it, if the Klein-Gordon field has temporarily well, or permanently, a very large potential, then while it has a large potential, this term is dominant, but notice the minus sign here, which you can verify by going through the steps here. Notice this minus sign, which means that for very large values of the potential, the equation of state parameter goes to minus 1, which is to say that the Klein-Gordon field will behave gravitationally as if we had a perfect fluid with equation of state parameter minus 1, which is weird. What does it mean, equation of state parameter minus 1? It means that the pressure is minus 1, the energy density. So we have a large energy density because we have a large potential, but the pressure is negative. We have a large negative pressure. What is that doing? As we will later see, when the energy density is large and the pressure is large negative, then the universe expands like mad. The uh, Einstein equations will have a very special behavior when that happens, when the energy momentum tensor of matter 
has positive energy density but negative pressure. This is what a cosmological constant does. It produces a positive energy density and a negative pressure. And this is also what um, a Klein-Gordon field with a potential does. It produces positive energy and negative pressure. There's another way to see why that is what happens. Remember the energy momentum tensor of a Klein-Gordon field? Um, and Gordon field, here it is. Energy momentum tensor of a Klein Gordon field. Here's the potential. Now, <clears throat> let us go into a coordinate system where g mu nu is eta mu nu. The zero component, the zero zero component is minus one. The ii components are plus one. Then what do we have? Then we have that a large potential, if the potential is large, gets multiplied with a minus one half and the zero zero component, let's say, let's look at the zero zero component first. So we get a positive number here, and that contributes to the zero zero component of the energy momentum tensor. So a large potential of a Klein Gordon field translates into a large zero zero component of the energy momentum tensor. However, what if we look at the II component of the energy momentum tensor? Well, then the II component of G is positive. We have a negative sign in front of it, and this is large. So we have a just as large number, but just with opposite sign for the pressure in the energy momentum tensor. Or oh, sorry, for the for the um, space space components of the energy momentum tensor. So you see, it's unavoidable <coughs> when you have a scalar field that the sign flips between energy density and pressure if this part is dominating over that part, and that's why it is in the standard model of cosmology, now considered um, uh, crucial that, um, I mean, this, this phenomenon is considered crucial because it provides a mechanism for having a temporary cosmological constant. The potential can be temporarily large. So at the heart of modern cosmology is the idea that the potential of a, cosmo of a of a Klein-Gordon field was temporarily large and therefore temporarily produced a large positive energy, large negative pressure, and that made the universe expand initially so dramatically that any pre-existing curvature was flattened out and we ended up with a flat universe um, as it is now, expanded until the potential dropped down again and then we had the usual phase with the um, cosmological, uh, with the equation of state parameter of returning back to normal. During inflation, the, the parameter is supposed to have been close to minus one. Um, maybe let me leave you with uh, some weird indications of, from experiments. You see that ratio? It can be positive as big as one, negative as small as minus one. The weird thing is that experimental indications are that it might have been smaller than minus one. It's weird. I mean, the, the error bars are large, but the error bars really reach very well into the uh, smaller than minus one region. And some experiments would have it that it's favored to be smaller than minus one. And so that requires some rethinking of, um, of what's going on. Anyway, I think we all deserve <laughs> a break. Okay, so I'll uh, see you on Friday then, and let me know if there are any questions.